All right, Brambrough back with some Grand Tactician Civil War. We're playing as the Confederate States of America in version 1.06, which went live as the main version of the game not too long ago. Basically, what's going on in this campaign, it is early winter, 1861. We're almost to December. Uh, and we got a couple of sieges going on. Uh, and I think there's going to be more uh, sieges going on in this episode. Right. Uh, let me start off with uh, kind of going over some recent comments to, uh, to the, in the series. One person mentioned, hey, I'm from Milledgeville. Can you zoom in close to Milledgeville? I want to see what it looks like on the map. I think we can do that. It should be said, there are multiple Milledgevilles in the United States. <laughs> so I hope I've got the right one. But there's only one that I see that uh, is actually an IIP on the map, and that is Milledgeville, Georgia. Which is off a little bit southeast of Atlanta, not far from Macon, Georgia. And this is as close as I can get to Milledgeville, Georgia on this map. So uh, let's see here. There's a little river over here. I don't know, in real life it might be a pretty big river. I have no idea. It's big enough to need a bridge over it, apparently. Uh, I don't know what the name of this river is. Perhaps our commenter can enlighten us in the comments. I could look it up on Google Maps, I'm sure, but uh, I'll let an expert let us know. So this looks like kind of like, uh, you know, some farmland in that area, uh, kind of a cleared area there in the River Valley uh, with a lot of, I'm sure it's pine forest uh, all around in this area as well. And there you have it. Showcase for today, Milledgeville, Georgia. Salute. <laughs> There's a cultural reference that probably no one under the, under the age of uh, maybe 50 would get. <laughs> Look up a show called Hee Haw <laughs> on Wikipedia or something. That's where that comes from. All right. Another commenter brought up a really good point that I had not thought of before. We've talked before... Um, I, I've, I've talked before in these series about how brigades are the lowest level of unit that are, mo that are modeled in the game. And so, you know, there's not a mix of attributes if you combine units, right? That, the, you know, the game doesn't track troops in a unit being from different states or having different weapons. Um, and so one can take a brigade of say Alabama troops armed with rifle A and let's say you've got a thousand of them and then you have another brigade with Virginia troops armed with rifle B And there's a thousand of them. Okay. And so what happens is if you take this Alabama brigade with rifle A and you drag it over and combine it into the Virginia brigade with rifle B, those thousand Alabamians armed with rifle A magically become magically become Virginians armed with rifle B. And so you can do things that are a little, you know, kind of gamey. <laughs> like you can take mixed musket guys and they can magically become armed with sharps rifles or something. <laughs> um, but the comment that, that uh, someone made a really good comment is that the fact that you can combine, you know, that you can kind of manage how many troops you have from a particular state is significant. If, you, if one has a state that you're having support problems with, you can combine them into 
another brigade, and whoa, you magically got the, you know troops from a different state now. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that all of those troops that are, are freed up and then go back into the volunteer pool. I don't, you know, I, I don't know if that happens. But it does mean that now there's a brigade there that is no longer sucking in replacements and is no longer taking casualties. So, it, you know, with you know, with some micro and stuff, that that's a tool available to manage state support. And I had not thought of that before. And that that's a that's a pretty good idea. Thank you. And so if we and we we are having a little bit of a problem with Virginia state support, and part of that is because part of Virginia is under union. Let me do the front lines again. Part of Virginia is under union control. To include McClellan's army over here. And so, you know, the fact that the Union controls Wheeling and Grafton and Clarksburg and Beverly and Parkersburg and at least for the moment, uh, Leesburg, that is having an effect on Virginia state support. And at the beginning of the campaign, I did mention that I intended to let the Union have West Virginia so it would split out. And then in the remaining Virginia, we wouldn't have as much support problems. And I took Old Dominion policy for this starting policy for the same reason. And that's not working out so well because <laughs> I've left Charleston, still currently Virginia, wide open for the Union to come grab. I don't have any forces in what would be West Virginia and the Union is just not acting on it. So that that little uh, idea has turned into a bit of a dud so far. But the other reason why Virginia is having support problems, I think, is because let me go back into this army view here. And let's go to and this is the only way I know to display state by state breakdown. Uh, in Virginia, we have zero available volunteers. And the reason we have zero isn't because Virginia has crap manpower. They don't. It's because they're already mobilized. And there are more Virginia troops in the military than from any other state. Georgia is second with 10,000. Alabama at 9,500. So even those are still several thousand lower than Virginia is. And because we have so many troops in Virginia units, they've also taken 5,000 casualties. Because the armies where those Virginia tr troops are have done a lot of the fighting. Okay? Virginia has taken 5,000 casualties, which is way more than any other state and is about, uh, about a, th a little over a third of our total casualties. We have less than 15,000 casualties, but 5,000 of them are all from Virginia. I think this is probably at least as big a contributor, if not even bigger a contributor, to, st to the lower state support in Virginia than uh, the IIPs that are under unit control. So I haven't done it yet, <clears throat> and I don't know if I'm going to actually go through and do it in this episode, at least not on camera. But uh, what I could do is I could go through these armies, find the Virginia units, right, and not get rid of the troops, but combine them with a non-Virginia unit in such a way that we can get the total Virginia guys in uniform from 15,000 down to something like 10 or 12,000 right I could do that and I may I'm not doing it immediately this moment anyway that was a really good idea and I thought that was worth talking about okay what else we got here
Someone else brought up a good question that uh, I thought I knew the answer to. However, I realized I didn't know the answer to. And that question was, okay, so when troops sit for a while in this game, they are training and they gain experience. And that's known. We've talked about that before. Uh, and the question was, do the fort garrisons get the same thing? Does that happen with them? And my initial thought was, I don't think it does. But let's look. Let's find out. Okay, so now no one's going to be real high because we're still in 1861 and that training is a slow process. I mean, it takes uh, well into 1862 um, to get a lot of the troops even just at regular level, which is about medium. Okay, so our, most troops are going to be, still be poor at this point even the ones that we've had since campaign start. But that is influenced by their commander's uh, administration attributes. Okay. So let's just look at an army that has been in existence since the beginning of the campaign. Uh, Beauregard's army. Most, most of the units in Beauregard's army uh, have been... Oh, he's got his second perk. Uh, we'll go with... Uh, I think flying column. Most of these units have been in existence since the beginning of the campaign in July 1861, and they have managed to get themselves up to poor, which is pretty typical for late 1861. Uh, the Peninsula Army. Some of these are new units, some are not. They've managed poor as well. Okay, so let's look at a fort that has a uh, that has a unit in it and see how they're doing. Well, that's a got to go down here to get the icon. Fort Pal uh, Fort McAllister. Okay, they're untrained. Fort Pulaski, regular. Fort Walker, untrained. Fort Johnson, regular. Fort Sumter, untrained. Fort Moultrie, untrained. Fort Caswell, poor. Untrained. Wow, Fort Macon's actually good. Now, we don't know what level these guys started at on July 8th, 1861. I would be willing to bet that Fort Macon Garrison wasn't good. That's pretty interesting. I'm kind of curious now to see what the administration is on that Caswell guy. Fort Pulaski was at regular. Jenkins is two stars in administration. So this may be a big reason why Pulaski is higher than average. And this also brings out something else. I went through and I put political officers in all the V forts. All right. I put lesser political officers in there. If Jenkins had been a straight all two star guy at the time that I did that in July 1861, I wouldn't have put him in a fort. I would have saved him for a brigade command in um, a field army. I don't know exactly what he was. I, I just know that I, I wouldn't have put him in with straight two stars and everything. So what does that tell us? That tells us that he has gained stars even though he's sitting in a fort somewhere not having done any combat. All right. All the officers do slowly increase over time and that is what this military experience stat does. All 
right? This slowly grows over time, and I've talked about this before. I'm just reiterating the point because we see it in action here. This number, we're up to 21. We started at something like 13 or 14, probably. Um, as this number grows, all officers slowly increase their stats. It's, it's not fast, but it does happen. And that's what, that's one of the things that uh, these, let me find it, that these military academies do. The Confederacy has two. The Citadel at South Carolina, which is a t tier two um, military academy. Let's look at the tooltip. Overall improvement of military experience, plus 3.5%. And, and that is overall, that's nationwide. And it also increase of commander attributes per year, statewide. So every South Carolina officer increases its attributes a little bit faster than from the other states, or from the states that do not have military academies. And then it also uh, reduces loss of experience for promotions for South Carolina South Carolina officers and uh, it, it also reduces loss of support uh, from the draft that's a tier two the other military academy which the South has is up here somewhere in the Shenandoah Valley if I can find it Where is that bugger? There it is. Virginia Military Institute, VMI. And it's a tier three. So it, ha it has even more of all of those uh, benefits. So let's go back to Fort Pulaski. And I'm going to bet, I don't know. I really don't. <laughs> I'm going to bet that Jenkins is either is either a South Carolina or Virginia officer. Virginian, right? So A, he's gotten the benefit of military experience along with all other Confederate officers, but he's been getting even more from Virginia because of VMI. So that's a little something about how experience and uh, military academies work. Okay. A couple episodes ago, I mentioned uh, that uh, I had changed my mind and that I was taking Bragg's command, which is a recruiting command not intended for combat from Atlanta, but he happened to have a whole bunch of new re recruited units coming and that we would take them down and besiege and take four Pickens. Uh, and someone uh, pointed out in comments, hey, you didn't do that yet. Hey, I'm getting to it. You know, campaign kind of unfolds at its own pace. At least mine do. <laughs> I'm getting to it. So let's see. Uh, Bragg is at yellow readiness. And have all his recruited units actually arrived? Ah, they have. And he's got a butt ton of artillery. Now all these units are earmarked for other armies. This isn't going to stay uh, as big. But Bragg has got them all now. So is their final graduation exercise? <laughs> I think yellow is good enough. Let's come on down here and have Bragg besiege Ford Pickens. The interesting part is, can he do it from this side of the bay, or is he going to have to march around here onto this spit of land? I don't know the answer to that. We'll just see if he can besiege if we just march him right here. And yeah, you can ride the railroad. Alright, Bragg. Off you go. Let's see if that results in a siege or if we have to move him. Okay, what's going on in the various theaters? Last episode, we just fought uh, a battle 
Matter of fact, the battle is technically still going on. Uh, Army of Indiana came down here to attack Sterling Price's Missouri Army at Lebanon, Missouri. And uh, it wasn't qu it wasn't quite two to one, but we were pretty pretty substantially outnumbered and got a little bit lucky, to be honest, on the map and the setup. The the location of the objective was was such that we were able to set up a nice defensive position behind uh, creeks, um, and and that enabled us to to do pretty well in that battle. Uh, it, it was pretty lopsided, to be honest. It, you know, we inflicted 6,000 casualties and took uh, about 500, I think. And, uh, but there was a little bit of luck involved there just in the initial setup. It was just a great position. And, to be honest, it's hard for me to really find a major breakdown in the AI for that battle. Kind of, uh, you know, no matter which way he had come, uh, we had good artillery positions, we had fortifications, and they were obliged to cross uh, waterways in such a way that even if they had come from a different direction, they were going to have the same problem. And, it, you know, waterways are a huge effect on fatigue and, ter and uh, cohesion. Um, and so, you know, you, you look at the battle in the last episode, and it's like, well, didn't no chance there. <laughs> but then I'm looking, I was like, well, what else is the AI going to do? And it's hard to really come up with a realistic answer for a game AI, even one much better than this one. So that happened. And uh, so pretty soon, uh, Army of Indiana is going to begin uh, its rear guard action and retreating probably only as far as here, though, because the Union owns this IIP. And we still have an unengaged army here of another 11,000 men. So Price might have to be fighting again pretty soon. There's the Army of the West in Missouri. And there's the Army of Southwest Missouri. So we have four separate Union armies in Missouri right now. And even though I haven't particularly been trying to make this the focal point of the entire campaign, you know... The Union does not like our presence here, and they are putting some troops into here. Now, each individual one of these armies uh, is probably not that threatening, but it's possible that they could keep coming in, and we have to fight several battles in a row, and prices, you know, price might win the individual battles, but fighting a series of them you know, could find his, you know, himself in a real bad ammunition situation uh, and degraded readiness. And even if the casualty ratios are favorable in each individual battle, you know, this army can get ground down. So we'll see how that works out. What is his ammo situation? Yeah, see, he's real low on uh, artillery ammo now. That's what's happening in Missouri. It did occur to me, had a plan to come down here and take Cairo, Illinois. Didn't do it because the Army of the Mississippi was sitting in Cairo, Illinois. Well, the Army of the Mississippi has come on over here into Missouri. Cairo's open again. And I'd been a little reluctant to come in and take Cairo because I thought that uh, that would kind of provoke the Union into doing the same sort of thing over here of sending in several armies to continuously try to retake Cairo, Illinois. And that could well happen. However, he's already doing that in Missouri. <laughs> he's already doing that to some extent in Virginia. So, you know, we've got a situation where Beauregard and Johnston and, and Magruder and Price are in a situation where they either are now or are going to be fighting multiple battles. 
Well, Sidney Johnson isn't doing diddly. So, yeah, let's get him involved. Uh, I'm going to have Sidney Johnson get back on the transports and come down the river and take Cairo, Illinois. Like so. Now that does leave Louisville kind of undefended, so he may have to get back on his transports and run back up the river pretty soon. <laughs> but for now, we'll take that uh, we'll take that opportunity. Okay, even though it's winter, but I don't I don't think uh, now he may still move a little slower, but. It'll be pretty fast. I don't think you'll take a whole lot of attrition losses doing that. Okay, we've got Bragg moving down on uh, Fort Pickens. I know that'll make a lot of people happy. <laughs> and we've got two sieges going on up here in Virginia. Let's see how those are going. We've got the Peninsula Army under John Magruder besieging Fort Monroe which is key to control the lower Chesapeake and Hampton Roads. Oh, we are just about there. Just about. Conditions to zero. Um, firepower is at zero. We've now got one garrison brigade in broken status and Duryi is at unstable. So this is going to wind up, I think, very, very soon. We're at 95 to five. That should only take really a couple more days as soon as I get time rolling. Well, usually there's a little larger tooltip that indicates an estimate on how much longer. I'm not getting it. Whatever. And then we got some trench warfare going on up here in Northern Virginia where McDowell's Army of Northeastern Virginia came down here and engaged in trench warfare with Johnson and Beauregard. And this is going pretty heavily in our favor as well. We're at uh, 84.16. It has hovered kind of at that uh, proportion for quite a while. But I think this is pretty confident, you know, pretty strongly in our favor. Uh, he only has seven guns left, apparently, compared to our 90. We have taken more casualties. And McDowell has actually taken, taken negative casualties. He's at minus 189. And the hypothesis from the last episode is that the casualty rate is so low that replacements coming into his brigades are actually overcompensating and his army is actually growing. That's the only explanation I can think of for why his casualty numbers are negative. Meanwhile, we're actually taking casualties. It's a very small number. I don't think it's anything to be worried about. But I don't think replacements are coming into our brigades at the rate that replacements are coming into the unions. And that might be because several of the brigades in Beauregard's and Johnston's army are Virginia brigades. And Virginia has the lower state support. And so that's probably affecting uh, the rate at which replacements are coming in to those specific brigades. And the other brigades, from places like Alabama and Louisiana and so forth, that maybe replacements are coming in just fine at a rate comparable to the Union brigades, but not in the Virginia brigades. And I think there's four. I think uh, Johnson has two Virginia Brigades and uh, Beauregard has two Virginia Brigades. And those units, I talked before about kind of fiddling around and, and trying to get the number of Virginia troops down by merging brigades. I won't do those. I won't do that with those brigades in these two armies because those brigades have actually gained some experience and are like one or two stars already and I don't want to mess with that they're gonna stay Virginia brigades however in the Peninsula Army which is a little bit newer um, 
there are multiple Virginia brigades that were there at campaign start. And those units have not yet fought enough to get some star, some experience stars. So if I kind of uh, fiddle around with Virginia brigades for state support reasons, it's going to be in this army. Okay, so that's what's going on, and I think uh, here we are, and I've been talking for about 30 minutes. As I said before, the campaign just kind of meanders at its own pace. <laughs> Let's get time rolling. See all these sieges turn out. Okay, C Confederate armies invade the north. And I think what we just got there, this newspaper headline corresponds to... When in Union territory has now flipped to yes. A couple of episodes ago, noticed that I had not gotten that objective complete despite having won a battle in Missouri at Springfield. And I was a little I was a little confused because Missouri is a Union state, so I felt like that battle should have met the conditions for achieving that objective. However, uh, Springfield starts the campaign as a Confederate-controlled IIP. Because this spot right here, I think, is where uh, the Missouri State Guard starts the campaign. So even though it was a, a Union IAP at the time we came in here and fought that battle, it had started the game as a Confederate IIP, and I think that's probably why didn't get credit for winning in Union territory with that battle at Springfield. Lebanon, however, if I recall correctly, is about where the Union Missouri Army starts so this was a Union-controlled IIP at the start of the campaign. And now having won at Lebanon in this battle from last episode, we got credit for winning in Union territory. I think that's the way that it appears to me how that works. I thought before it went by who owns the state. Now it appears to me based on who controlled that IIP at campaign start. And there goes Fort Monroe. Butler surrenders. Okay. Total casualties 4,300 men because we captured well, 4,300 men. And more importantly, we captured their weapons. 4,300 rifles. No artillery, which seems kind of weird because it's a fort. <laughs> there was artillery there, damn it. Why didn't we capture that? Maybe because we destroyed it all. They had zero artillery by the end of the siege. So, 4,300 rifles. That's good. Now, it could just be mixed muskets. A lot of times these headlines pop up twice. I'm not sure why. Let's see, if, let's see if we can figure out if we captured anything good. That looks the same. Ooh! Ooh! We picked up some Hall rifles. It's a very good early game weapon. <laughs> well, it's, it's a pretty good weapon all throughout the campaign. And we got 4,300 of these. Wow. I need to hunt around and find two brigades of about 2,000 apiece. See if I can 
get these into two brigades instead of just one. That's a good hit there. Why is it a good hit? Eight rounds a minute. That's why. And we've talked about the Hall's uh, rifle and carbine before in this uh, series. <clears throat> and uh, what's the accuracy on these things? Uh, very good accuracy. Nice. 400, very good accuracy. 400 yard range, eight rounds per minute. Heck yeah, we're going to use those. And that's probably... It sounds like that's all those rifles we got were all Halls, I think. Did we get any more? Uh, nope, we didn't get any uh, Springfields. Well? Might not have been in at Fort Monroe, but looks like we've picked up some more Mississippis as well. I got 4,800 of these. Our order didn't show up. That's still... A hundred days away. That's good. And Springfield muskets mixed. With, okay. So it's possible we, we might have picked up some Mississippi's in the battle over in Missouri. I guess. Okay. So that's a that's a pretty. As a matter of fact. I'm going to go ahead and, if I wait and do it later, I mean, the brigades grow. Let's see if I can catch a smaller brigade. Yeah, Jones has got 1,500 men, and he's already picked up a little bit of experience. Let's give Jones some hauls. Heck yeah. And on a weapon like that, where I don't have very many, I like for those troops to stand out in the tactical battles. You know, so my eye is drawn to, there's where my hauls rifles are. So I'm going to give these guys uh, red, red coats. And how about Hood? Yeah, he's got muskets right now. We can fix that. And John Bell, ooh, no. It says we have 2,400 here. He's got 2,300 men. It's not quite letting me. can, however, give him some Mississippis. Let's do that. Okay, there we go. Beauregard's army is now fully rifle-armed. This is our first uh, fully rifle-armed uh, infantry uh, army. Now, Bonham's been kicking butt with these Mississippi rifles. He's five experienced stars. He himself, uh, yeah, he's come up pretty good in his own experience and attributes. And just based on that, Holmes should have come up some as well. Just with Bonham being in his division. Eh, not so much. <laughs> Holmes is still Holmes. Well, Holmes is new uh, because A.P. Hill recently got wounded. In, this is actually A.P. Hill's division. So most of the combat that these guys have done were under a different division command. And that's why Holmes is not looking all that hot. Because he has just recently been put into this. Okay, let's look at, uh, okay, rifles here, and 2,700 men, too many to give 
uh, halls to, but maybe Mississippi's, nope, can't do Mississippi's either. Brigade's too big. 2,800, 1,900? I think we got enough Mississippi's, nope, we don't. Aha, uh -huh. however, we have enough halls. The question is, do I want to give halls to Donaldson? We'll come back to that. But we have a candidate brigade here. How about McBride? These guys all have rifles here. Double check uh, Johnston. I don't think there's any rifles in any of these brigades, but they may all be too large. Withers well, is pretty good. That's not what I meant. Uh, let's give Mississippi's to Withers. These guys are still, but both of these brigades are too large. Jackson, Anderson. All right, this brigade, let's give him, well, let's give them not only Hall's rifles, but a better commander. <laughs> sort by leadership, okay. Cal looks pretty good. Hawes looks pretty good. Halls is kind of, Halls is a calf guy though. I'm gonna save him for that. Gabriel Reigns. Yeah. How about you take command of that brigade? And how about you guys get some hall rifles? Which means I need to change your uniform. give you a more jaunty looking setup here. That looks fairly jaunty. That That's kind of regulars though. There you go. There's some attitude here. Okay. Right, so Fort Monroe is now a Confederate fort. It put a random volunteer officer in there. Let's get a political officer in there. To boost state support. Because he's just a random, you know. This is the random guy they stuck in here, right? This is not a historical officer. So even if we pick a shitty political officer, it's still going to be an improvement over this dude. <clears throat> Let's see if we have a Virginia officer available. We do. However, they may all be... Epa Hunton. Yeah, these other guys are a little bit too good to stick in a fort. Kenton Harper is actually a fairly interesting guy. Uh, very definitely a historical character. 
here, here I go, one of my tangents. Um, it's just apparently it's hard to find a picture of the guy. Um, but he served early, he, uh, just during 1861, in his first stint. But this is the guy who, uh, right at the beginning of the war, Virginia troops, they're not Confederate troops right yet, they're part of the Virginia Provisional Army. Um, so state of Virginia troops, the Confederate Army hasn't really been organized yet, run into Harper's Ferry, which was a major uh, arsenal, uh, an armory, uh, controlled by the U.S. Army. And these Virginia troops went in there and captured it. And much of the inventory was successfully destroyed, but they still got a whole bunch of uh, weapons uh, right at the outbreak of the war. Uh, and also a lot of the... Uh, it wasn't just a storage place for weapons. It was a manufacturing location for rifles. Uh, and possibly artillery too. I'm not too sure about that. And a lot of that machinery got moved down to Richmond uh, to uh, the Tredegar Iron Works. Well, Kenton Harper was the guy who did that. Uh, he and uh, another general whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, but So Harper captured... Uh, Harper's Ferry uh, in the summer of 1861 and then as that uh, Confederate army kind of formed up and those troops were folded into the Confederate army from Virginia to Confederacy Stone, uh, Stonewall Jackson who was not yet Stonewall Jackson uh, Thomas Jackson forms what would eventually become famous as the Stonewall Brigade, from which he drew his own nickname there. Uh, this guy, Kenton Harper, and it was five, I think it was five Virginia regiments, initially, that formed that brigade. And Kenton Harper was one of the regimental commanders in the original Stonewall Brigade that then went and fought and earned that Stonewall nickname at the Battle of First Manassas uh, in July 1861. And, it, and Harper appears to have done very well uh, during that short service. And then what happened is, I guess, apparently, even though, you know, Jackson wrote good reports on the guy and apparently thought well of him, you know, not everyone's per, you know, everyone. No one's perfect. <laughs> and one thing that Jackson was not all that perfect on was getting along well with subordinates. And apparently he didn't get along well with Harper, even though he thought Harper was a good regimental commander. And they... Well, they just didn't get along, and Harper quit the army. And I've, from, from what I've read, my understanding is that... Har Harper was also pretty old at this time. What does it say here? 60. Yeah. He's not a young guy. And uh, Harper's wife, and he was from the Shenandoah Valley. This was all kind of local to him. And uh, he, uh, his wife was dying. And he didn't live very far away. And so, and, and, this was after the Battle of Bull Run. It's not like there's an enormous campaign about to develop. And Harper wanted to go home because his wife was dying. And Jackson wouldn't let him. Anyway, so, so Harper quit the army over that. And uh, I can't say I blame him. I think I would too. So Harper spent uh, the next several years after that. Um, you know, his, his wife passed. 
And uh, anyway, he served in the Virginia legislature uh, for the next several years. And then in 1864, he re-entered the army. Uh, and I believe he served uh, under Jubal Early in the 1864 uh, fighting in the Shenandoah Valley under Jubal Early and uh, was with Early wherever Early was at the time of the surrender in 1865. So there's a little bit about Kenton Harper. Not a random dude, real dude, and a little interesting story behind him. They just couldn't find a picture. Anyway, for Fort Monroe, I think we're going to go with Epa Hunt. Just because he's the least good of all these dudes. And, and that state legislature. And I think he had been in politics before the war, too. So that's why uh, Harper is tagged as a political officer. But he appears to have done pretty well. And they seem to have approximated that with, his, uh, with the stats that he does have. But that'll kind of explain how he's a pretty good guy, but probably no one's ever heard about him. I hadn't either. I was, my interest was piqued uh, by the lack of a portrait. I was like, is this guy real? Well, it turns out he was, and that was the story behind him. Okay, but Epa Hunton is going to Fort Monroe. Uh, I don't think we need a garrison there. I don't really expect it to be attacked. I'm just putting Hunton in there to do what we can about Virginia State support. You can see I didn't have anybody lower, uh, really. I, you know, I, I already had prioritized Virginia political officers, putting them, command, putting them in command elsewhere. And now, I don't know why it's showing Peninsula Army still engaged. It may not let me move them yet. It does. Well, let's just go ahead and let's just go ahead and move him right up on in here. Maybe if he shows up and throws his numbers into this siege, that'll be enough to just boom, tip it over. They're pretty close anyway. Let's bring uh, Peninsula Army up to here. So they've done their job. So it, you know, I don't think they're coming back to the peninsula. Need to think of a new name for them. Or do I'll just leave the Peninsula Army until the Corps is formed. This will eventually be the third Corps in the Army of Northern Virginia. Okay. Uh, historical flavor. How is Bragg doing? Has he started his. Well, he's still moving. Come on, Bragg, get down there. interested to see if he's able to initiate a siege across the water. I think he can. I've seen armies do that before. The CSA likes to, you know, when you're when the player is Union, the, the CSA likes to besiege Fort Washington from over on the Virginia side of the Potomac. Oh, come on. Well, crap. Okay. He's going to have to go around to the other side, I think. Fine. I want him to march, though. I don't want him to... There we go. I don't know if crossing water affects the siege calculations. But it sounds like it should, and it sounds like something we wouldn't want to do. Well, we've just issued some more bonds. And it is December 1st, which means we have another Econ and Intel report. Let's see how we're doing. BBB, mediocre. I think it's another drop. We're up to $315 million in debt. I think we'll get helped out fairly soon by researching the Tariff Act and the Impressment Act. That's my that's my near-term plan anyway. Uh, recovery, 
Uh, mediocre and increasing for private wealth. Good, good. Uh, tax revenues deep. Well, there's a big part of... Why is our... So the economy is improving. Private wealth is increasing. Yet our tax revenues decrease. That sucks. I built the one market. That was the one that I started at Knoxville. Kind of maintaining about a two and a half to one uh, import to export uh, trade balance. Corporate production dropped, and we're lacking iron ore, food, and iron. So iron ore and iron. We need to get that damn iron mine upgraded. Intel. Ooh, so federal government is also pursuing the Tariff Act. That makes sense. Uh, they've done a level of recruitment offices. Okay. Haven't recruited any men in the last month. Interesting. But they've built 19 more ships, or started building 19 more ships. Federal Army's morale, 80% which is an increase. I can't really think of anything that has happened over the past month that would cause their army morale to increase. Because they've lost Fort Monroe and they lost that battle in Missouri. Now it was low because they had lost the previous battle in Missouri. So it, it would have come up, except they just lost another one. So that should have dropped. So I don't know. This may not be reflecting. Uh, anyway, I don't know. I don't know why their morale increased. And they are still carrying out offensive operations. Okay. Uh, let's go up and have a look at our industry subsidy and where we're at with upgrading this iron mine. We need to do that. The market's almost done. That's good news. Telegraph is building here. That horse artillery is working away on that station. And still got a little bit to go here. If we bought it now, it would cost us $12 million. But we're pretty close to being able to buy it with all subsidies. I'm going to wait for that. How are we doing on this telegraph? Uh, the first engineers are on their way up to Salem for the next telegraph station. Is that right? Just make sure that that's within the radius. Yeah, we, we need to build it just south of Salem. That's right. I remember that now. How it, okay. Sidney Johnson is on the river and has just about arrived at Cairo. Didn't really expect that. <laughs> okay, so uh, right there we just had a battle initiated at Lebanon between Price and Fremont. And uh, I had intended to make that into a separate episode. However, uh, didn't last very long. And straight up, I, it, I'll just put it this way. <clears throat> what happens next, I've never seen in this game before. <laughs> and I did not think was possible. And I would be willing to bet that most, maybe all of you, I don't know. There's always, you know at least most. 
I would think. Probably have never seen this before either. Um, so, let's see what happens. Uh, Sterling Price's Missouri Army had been attacked yet again <laughs> in Missouri at the same place, at Lebanon, Missouri, South Central Missouri. And we are here for that battle. This is the second battle of Lebanon in this campaign. It is 9.30 in the morning on day one. Uh, unlike the last battle, uh, we've got good weather. It's cold, but it's clear. So we're going to have better visibility than the thunderstorm that we fought in just a few days ago. That battle was uh, November 28th and it's December 2nd, so it's only been four days since we fought... Uh, George Morrell's Army of Indiana, and now we have uh, John C. Fremont's uh, Army of which army is this? Which Ar Army of the Mississippi? I think. Yeah, Army of the Mississippi, which is smaller. Uh, he's got eleven thousand men. However, um, he's got f four brigades. Three infantry and one cavalry. They are full size. So, you know, that's almost... Uh, that's So he's got over 10,000 men. But they're just in those four brigades. And according to our estimate... Strength report. He doesn't have any guns. So... The weather's different, but the map is not. We're defending in the same area, and it's actually shaping up the same way. It's a defensive battle, which is appropriate. He attacked us. I didn't go pick in this fight. He's coming from up here with the same place that the Army of Indiana came in. Uh, up here, uh, coming down the wire road. We are slightly defending. We are defending in a slightly different place. Uh, the objective is over here on Terrell Creek. And it seems pretty obvious that uh, the direct route for uh, Fremont is to come down the wire road, cross Wilson Creek here, and come right on down onto the objective. So I've set up a pretty, you know, the, the plan is pretty simple. I've set up a defensive works uh, on the far side of Terrell Creek, or Terrell, Terrell, Terrell. And even though it's in a slightly different spot, the idea is the same. Uh, Fremont is going to be obliged to, tack, to attack into a fortified position while crossing a creek. And what I've done is... Uh, it had some engineering points. I didn't quite have enough for all parapets. So, I mean, what I could have done was put a little bit of parapet in the center. Uh, but anyway, I got parapets on this side, breastworks on that side. And uh, <clears throat> I've got the four rifle-armed brigades in the line right here. Three of them are Mississippis. Our Texas Germans are armed with Springfield rifle muskets. Uh, the howitzers are behind them, and they're they're a little bit higher. I believe they'll, they're going to be able to fire over the line. And then uh, we've got Little's uh, Three Brigade Division uh, in reserve. Because Fremont may not come in frontally. He may load up on one side or the other, uh, which is why I have uh, a little bit of fortifications to refuse the flanks a little bit. I could have drawn this better I had already drawn <laughs> I had already put the fort fortifications down before I really realized uh, this hill here but uh, little little's guys can respond to either end if the Union tries a flank attack and that's about all there is to it the cavalry is up here at the edge of the deployment zone just to get an early indication and confirm that Fremont is coming down the wire road this way as we expect. This other route, which Morell took in the last battle, this track down here, um, it 
doesn't really feel like this makes as much sense. Although, <clears throat> because there's fortifications here, it is possible. So we're going to have the CAV get early scouting on the Federals and confirm that they're coming this way, not that way. So there's going to be a little bit of time running for um, uh, Fagan and Marmaduke to go find those guys, and I will be back. Yeah, just a quick update. Uh, Federals have been spotted. They did come right down the wire road like so. Cavalry in the cavalry in the lead. Marmaduke and Fagan have been shadowing them, staying just in front of them. Uh, scouts did take a little bit of fire <laughs> when they first ran into them. Uh, and so really the only remaining question is when they get to this intersection, are they going to continue down this way past the Gwyn place right into our position? Or will they make a left turn and come down this way and cross Terrell Creek? That remains to be seen. Let's see what happens. Well, it may have been a mistake putting Marmaduke up in these woods. He may catch a little fire here. Just pulling back to this next high ground. Marmaduke's got 1,200 men. This Cav Brigade alone was about 2,500 men. So don't really want him engaging in a stand-up uh, firefight with those guys. Yep, they're just coming straight on down. Let's see if the infantry brigades do the same thing. McCall is right behind McClernand. Turn or straight? Straight. Okay. Armaduke, you've done your job. Get back over here. Right. Well, let's go ahead and put our uh, let's put some skirmishers out. Let's get them right down here. In well, let's see here. And they've already got creek cover, so they're fine right where they are. Okay, Fremont. What you gonna do? I don't think Marmaduke needs his scouts anymore. Put the cav kind of up here. Artillery is opening up.
Okay, now he's going to form up in his position, in his formation for the attack. I think. So there's three of the four brigades. Banks is the division commander. That's one division. I don't know if we caught... There's the fourth. Yeah. MacArthur. So they all came this way. The other division didn't take an alternate route. Let's go ahead and have the artillery... They're firing in here anyway, but I think they'll get a little bit more XP if we give them a bombardment order. I think that'll do. It looks, it, it, when you look at the various artillery perks and the actions that are required to get those artillery perks, it, it seems to imply that bombardment generates XP toward perk slots, whereas, whereas uh, the default fire at will apparently may not. So. So I'm doing bombardment here. Same for counter battery, by the way. Okay, little skirmisher action to open the battle. It's legitimate. Okay, it looks like if they're going to try to move in on a flank at all, it looks like they're kind of thinking about this flank. We've already got the cab over here. Just move them a little bit over just to give some room there. And then we'll put Little's guys right about here. Looks like our guys are getting the better of this uh, very small skirmisher skirmish. <laughs> so that's fine. The brigades do have cover from the artillery fire up in here from woods and well in creek too. There is some cover from that, not very much. But the onus is on them to do something. Seventy casualties, Union side, twenty-five, our side. Be 
things along a little bit here. Let's pull those guys in before they break. Fresh set. Saul Ross's Texan skirmisher doing fine. And those skirmishers are sent home. Okay. Hundred and fifty to about forty. What's your next move, Fremont? AI Fremont. <laughs> Put a little cut in here. Let the artillery bombardment continue. Cut back in whenever. Looks like old John C. is gonna move. Right. Well, uh, for the rest of the day, uh, Fremont, Fremont didn't do anything. Uh, this is the same position that we had several hours ago in game time. It is December, which means that sunset is going to come at 5 p.m., only two minutes away. I wasn't doing anything. I decided that I wanted to conserve my artillery ammunition, so I even turned off the bombardment. Artillery haven't been firing at them for about an hour. And in just a couple minutes, we're going to go into the overnight deployment phase. And I'm a little curious on exactly what the, uh, what, uh, Fremont is going to do here. If anything, he's been sitting right there for about, I think about three hours. So let's see. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't look like he's moving. Do I want to redeploy anything here? Got a few more engineering points. I'm kind of thinking, how about... Nah, we're fine. That position's fine. It was already strong enough that he didn't really want to do anything against it. Uh, let's just uh, press play and see how it goes. It's 8 o'clock in the morning on December 3rd. It's still pretty dark. Let's see if he moves from this position. We've got the objective. We have the defended position. We have a minor victory, right? If nothing else changes, we've got a minor victory as it is, and he's going to have to retreat. Uh, so even though I've got a uh, substantial manpower advantage, I'm not going to march my guys across that creek and attack him. And he did not change position. So we got a little bit of a standoff going here. And I'm going to just move on forward and 
I'll be back whenever Fremont decides to move on day two. <laughs> It is now two minutes before 5 p.m. on day two, December 3rd. Not a single soldier has moved. Not a single shot has been fired. So I know this is kind of turning into most boring battle ever. However, at this point, it's kind of becoming a, like an experiment. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious to see is the AI really not is Fremont not going to do anything I'm you know I, I haven't quite seen this happen before so we're going to do it again <laughs> we've got the minor victory right at this point it's just huh let's see what happens I mean, if, if it happens again on day three, well, it's a minor victory and he's got to retreat. Okay, here we are, second night. We're taking, you know, both armies are taking more little casualties from attrition than they are from combat. It's pretty minor, you know, like maybe a hundred dudes or something. Okay. Well, okay. He, did, he didn't move. Again, he didn't redeploy. Well, when he starts to move, I'll be back. Okay. <clears throat> okay, it is now 1658. Two minutes to dusk on day three and not a single soldier has moved not a single shot has been fired Fremont has not moved a muscle Interesting. I would have thought that was going to take us straight into results screen. I've never done this before. That's why. That's why I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, my, it's curiosity on what the heck happens in this situation. Really? There can't be a day four, right? Is that possible? The battle actually opened at 9.33. Does it need to be 72 hours? Straight up, I did not realize a day four is possible. I thought all tactical battles ended at the end of day three. I'm just going to run time here at 10x until we get to 9.33. That's the time that we started the battle on day one. I mean, on one hand, it's like incredibly boring as hell. I get it. But we're I'm also kind of in uncharted territory here, or at least for me. Or do we have to just keep accruing objective points until the bar gets all the way to forces retreat? Oh 
Okay, 933 didn't do it. Well, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to let this play out. We're going to continue accruing objective points all the way to the end and just see if, if Fremont allows that to happen. Or maybe it ends at the end of day four. I already didn't know there could be a day four. But uh, anyway, I'll, you know, I'm just going to keep running like this until something happens. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I'll sit here all night in real time, but uh, I'm going to put the cut in here and come back and tell you how this turned out. Morning of day five. And this is almost solely because of objective points. 71 accrued so far. Day six. Okay. <clears throat> After five days of sitting motionless, the AI has started to move. And it looks like they are retreating. Maybe. Yeah. That's wild. Well, I'm just going to let them. Okay. Well, um... <laughs> I did not think it was possible for a tactical scenario, I, has, I hesitate to call it a battle, uh, could last beyond day three. And thinking back now, I'm not sure where, where I got that idea. I thought you just had three days. You don't. under really strange circumstances, which this certainly was, I guess there is no time limit. It just goes until the bar reaches a point where, you know, there's a big, you know, the bar has to reach a certain point, apparently. That's the end point. Maybe, maybe people knew this. I, I didn't. But, uh, so that's interesting and something I haven't seen before. And, I'm sure many of you, maybe most of you, have never seen before either. <laughs> and the other interesting thing there is, you know, it, it was an attack, it was a defensive situation for us, an attacking situation for the AI. We hold the objective, but with this strong defensive position and things so heavily stacked in front of the AI, apparently there is a limit where the AI general, you know, in this case, John C. Fremont, declined to attack. So I think all of that was pretty interesting. Now I gave up an opportunity here, right? I, I mean, you know, I, had a chance here to beat up that federal army, get some more experience for my guys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I kind of went into just what happens here mode, and I was curious to see, and that's what happened. Day battles can last can last longer than three days, and at least once in a while, occasionally, the AI will simply not attack into a dis. Uh, if the odds are that much against it and will accept the loss from not doing so. Okay. 
So I would expect time is still going to have to run here until dusk, and then he'll probably withdraw. Is my guess. We'll see. <laughs> And in fact, what what actually happened, it, th we did not go to the end of the day. Not too long after I made that last cut, uh, it, it, they just, it, you know, it just popped all the way to the end of the bar, I, probably when they exited the field, and just, we've gone into the retreat mode. Only four minutes left. Okay, he lost 650 men, and I lost 550 men, and that's all from attrition. I think there was a combined, perhaps, 200 between the two armies. Um, combat casualties. The rest of it was just attrition, because attrition just keeps running like normal um, during the overnight phases of battles. Uh, essentially, these were troops we were going to lose probably from attrition anyway. Uh, on the campaign map. Not much need to go look at the HQ report on this one. After the six-day non-battle of Lebanon. <laughs> so the other interesting thing there is, and normally you fight a battle on the tactical map, however many days it takes, and then when you go back out to the campaign map, it goes back to the first day, and then those armies are essentially frozen in battle for however many hours or uh, days that it took. And normally that's, you know, one or two days, maybe three occasionally. I've never seen anything longer than three. Maybe that's why I thought it couldn't go longer than three, and just kind of built up over time subconsciously. Well, in this case, it's going to be six days. And what happens if that army of Indiana decides to come attack while this particular non-battle is supposedly going on? Oh, we captured 283 rifles somehow. Yeah. Yeah, 640 men, 34 killed on his side. And we lost 549 men with six killed. 514 missing. I think that's the attrition losses. <clears throat> and Slack <laughs> gets fame for that. <laughs> he's, he's the artillery commander. Uh, so, you know, they bombarded a little bit on uh, day one. So it's, but Slack gets a Slack gets a medal. Good job, Slack. Okay. Well, I think that will do for this episode. Kind of a strange wind up there at the end. Uh, I think we learned a little something. I, I did anyway about how things can work in Grand Tactician. <laughs> All right. If you like what we're doing with the channel, if you like the content, then leave a like, leave a comment maybe even subscribe but at any rate thank you very very much for watching i appreciate it